Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar on, on conflicts in uh, Eurasia, best practices and dialogue and mediation from other regions of the world. This is the third event of the series of webinars uh, co-organized by the Geneva Center for Security Policy and the Mgimo University, Russia. And we're looking forward uh, to continuing this fruitful partnership. My name is Alexandra Matas. I'm the head of the Effective Governance Cluster at the GCSP. Uh, our center celebrates this year its 25th anniversary, and we are an international nonprofit foundation. We are physically based in Geneva, Switzerland, from where I am joining you today. Our foundation council comprises 53 member states, including the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, the GCSP's mission is to promote peace and international security and to prepare and transform individuals and organizations so that uh, they can create a safer world. We are impartial, independent and inclusive. The center does that on several parallel tracks through executive education, research and dialogue activities, including public discussions and closed professional meetings. In addition, we offer fellowship programs for executives in transition. Now I will say a few words about the topic of our webinar today. On November 10, the violent conflict between Armenia and Azerbaijan was declared to come to an end. However, we can still, uh, we have still a question how sustainable this agreement is given a lot of issues between the two countries that are still not solved, including the definition of the status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Today, we will discuss tools for peaceful settlement and mediation of conflicts in Eurasia, but also other regions of the world, and we will try to discover best practices which might potentially be helpful in the cases of hot and frozen conflicts in Eurasia. Our moderator today will be Dr. Yulia Nikitsina, leading research fellow uh, at the Center for the Post-Soviet Studies uh, at the Mgimo University, who is also the co-organizer of this event. And before handing it over to Yulia, I would like to attract your attention to the fact that it is a public event and it will be recorded until the Q&A session and then we will stop the recording. We will be taking your questions in the Q&A box, which you can find in the bottom of your screen. The link to this webinar recording will be afterwards available on the GCSP website. On this, I wish you all a fruitful uh, discussion and I hand it over to you, Yulia, please. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Yulia Nikitina, as Alexandra already uh, introduced me, uh, and I represent um, Gimo University uh, under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Uh, and uh, me and my uh, colleague Sergei Markidonov, we work at the Institute of International Studies, which is a group of research centers which provide expertise to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and also uh, organize uh, several uh, events uh, every month, uh, uh, practical uh, oriented uh, events and also academic events. And uh, it is my pleasure to moderate uh, this uh, event and uh, let me introduce the speakers uh, to you. Uh, so our first speaker will be Dr. Sergei Markidonov, uh, who is the leading researcher at the Euro Atlantic Security Center of the uh, Mgimo University. Uh, and he's an expert on de facto states in Eurasia and generally frozen conflicts in Eurasia. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Denis Matveev, who is a consultant, facilitator, and trainer in the fields of conflict transformation and dialogue. 
uh, Denise has worked with governments, de facto authorities, intergovernmental organizations, and NGOs in Ukraine, Russia, Moldova, Transnistria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Gorno Karabakh, Georgia, Abkhazia, Sri Lanka, Romania, also Afghanistan, Sudan, Kyrgyzstan, Myanmar. Uh, and uh, we uh, also uh, will be happy to uh, introduce uh, Julia, uh, Dr. Julia Palmiano Federer. Uh, who uh, is also a, a practitioner uh, and um, uh, until 2019 she was program officer in the mediation team at the Swiss Peace Foundation and she provided support to civil society and actors in the negotiating teams involved in uh, Myanmar peace processes. Uh, so uh, our experts will share their experience and their approaches to uh, best practices in dialogue and mediation. And the time limit uh, would be uh, around 10 minutes for each expert, uh, after which we will proceed to the Q&A session. Uh, and uh, for the participants, there is an opportunity to ask the questions in the Q&A uh, section. So please use this opportunity to ask the questions um, immediately after the presentation of the speaker to whom you address your question. And in the Q&A session, please also mention uh, who your question should go to. Uh, all right, so uh, dear speakers, dear participants, uh, I suggest that we start and uh, let me give the floor to Dr. Sergei uh, Markidonov with uh, his overview of the uh, situation with uh, frozen and hot conflicts in uh, Eurasia and his expertise on mediation practices. Sergei, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for this floor and for this opportunity. It's a privilege. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate GCSP with the 25th anniversary. It's a good uh, day and good time, I suppose, when childish years uh, have been overcome already and the uh, diploma on the higher education uh, is given. Now it's time to build some perspectives to uh, maybe start realizing of uh, some ambitious projects. This is why uh, please uh, share my uh, congratulations and best wishes. And now let me uh, move to uh, my topic directly. Uh, I suppose that uh, this title proposed for the discussion today uh, should be formulated wider. It's a problem of borrowing uh, ideas outside for the realization uh, on the ground in Eurasia. Ideas from uh, remote areas, for example. Is it possible to apply the European experience or experience from Asia, from some other conflicts to the areas of uh, problematic notes? Or, uh, conflict notes in the post-Soviet space. First of all, I cannot completely agree with uh, such definition as frozen conflicts, because frozen means absence of any dynamics. Uh, no warfare, but at the same time, no uh, resolution of the problem. In the case of Donbass, we don't see, for example, stop of warfare or suspension of warfare. Yeah, it's not so intensive as it was in 2014-15. Prior to February 2015, uh, signing of the uh, second draft of Minsk Accords, but nevertheless, in the case of Karabakh, uh, prior to the uh, latest outbreak of the violence, it was not also frozen. A lot of uh, attempts to unfreeze the conflict took place. Let's see on the escalation this July, some months prior to a new outbreak. Now uh, we see the uh, uh, stop of warfare, but at the same time, I am so doubtful about the uh, final resolution of this issue because uh, the uh, ceasefire um, joint statement is uh, interpreted in different ways. Uh, no mentions on final status of Nagorno Karabakh in this document, and at the same time, we see different um, estimates of the uh, uh, issue. Uh, Azerbaijan tends to close this uh, issue at all. And even in the national banks, uh, we see inscriptions, uh, zero percent of our territory is occupied now. But at the same time, some voices are sounded about 
Russian prosecutors and their presence there is estimated in different ways. Uh, I um, have been engaged in the uh, uh, roundtables, discussions, uh, conferences on the mediation and peacekeeping operations and conflict resolution, maybe for um, 20, 25 years at least. And a lot of offers are on the table to be discussed. Uh, let's see on the conflict in South Ossetia, for example. Uh, some years ago, especially prior to a new outbreak of violence in 2004, the idea of South Tyrol was on the table to be discussed. This model uh, was offered again by the Italian Prime Minister at that time, Matteo Renzi, in 2014, on the peak of the uh, uh, most intensive phase of the conflict in Donbass about uh, this uh, region, uh, Alto Adige, to apply to the Donbass area. And uh, of course, uh, when uh, Dr. Frattini, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Italy, was a person specially responsible at OSCE for the Transistent Conflict Resolution, he himself personally raised the question of this application three times. This is why case of South Tyrol was offered in different uh, cases in Eurasia, South Ossetia, Transnistria, and, and uh, Donbass. Uh, uh, some other cases uh, were also discussed, uh, for example, in uh, Abkhazia, idea of a Cyprus model. By the way, the idea of Cyprus model uh, began to be discussed in the Abkhazian context even prior to the uh, hot phase of the conflict in 1992. When I uh, wrote my uh, papers on the evolution of the Abkhazian conflict, uh, I addressed to the newspapers both Abkhazian and Georgian published in the territory of Abkhazia prior to the conflict uh, to, of war of 1992-1993. This problem was on the table in 1990, uh, two years prior to the conflict, when the two sides said uh, about perspectives how to organize partition of Abkhazia. And then uh, my good friend and colleague Ivlian Haindrava and uh, his uh, party behind him, Republican Party, raised the not same but similar question on the partition and uh, maybe exchange of territories and so on. Uh, of course, the uh, case of Northern Ireland was discussed in the context of Karabakh and uh, other Caucasus uh, conflict, uh, maybe not like model, but I know uh, personally a lot of uh, people who were scholars and uh, civil society activists who were uh, invited to the Northern Ireland to see the successful example. And um, uh, as far as I understand, we will uh, listen to about the evolving situation in Myanmar, Myanmar case. Uh, Myanmar case also influenced on Eurasia. The recent outbreak of violence between central authorities and Rohingya became a uh, part of the discussion in Russia, in Dagestan, in Chechnya, when leaders of uh, different Muslim communities of Russia and especially Ramzan Kadyrov blamed central authorities of uh, Myanmar, Burma for uh, repressions towards Rohingya and so on and so on. It was kind of reflection of the um, different Muslim communities on the fate of Rohingya, their perspectives and so on and so on. And of course, we can also uh, take into the account some uh, not only positive examples, but rather negative. Um, but of course, our estimate uh, uh, of uh, negative uh, sides or positive sides depends on directly our angle of observation. But nevertheless, let's see on Serbian crime. Yes, for Croatia, it's a rather successful uh, result and uh, resolution of the conflict. But uh, don't forget that this case, uh, the uh, realization of this uh, pacification was accompanied by ethnic cleansings. But this case was on the table to be discussed both in Georgia and Azerbaijan, in Georgia prior to 2008 events and in uh, current Azerbaijan, that central authorities will sweep the infrastructure of de facto statehood. In the context of Donbass, the Serbian crime pattern is also discussed. This is why conflict resolution and this motion is also uh, estimated in different ways. It's necessary to understand that final resolution of the conflict for many participants, many actors, is not only negotiations like final phase of this process. Sometimes it's operation. 
And in this way, the case of Nagorno-Karabakh could be treated also for tomorrow, even for today, as a pattern. Because uh, some uh, parts of the conflicts will appeal to it. Let's see on Azerbaijan. It uh, has uh, waited for uh, three decades and no success, no concrete results. Negotiations was not so good. And uh, uh, one month and a half was rather successful. Military operation and the problem is realized and no percent of the territory is occupied. It's also a pattern which will be part of the discussion. The other pattern, Kosovo. A lot of speculations around this area. In one of my speeches some years ago, I told about three cases of Kosovo. Kosovo as itself, Kosovo as a perception for the West as a unique case. Every case is unique. Myanmar is not uh, looking like uh, Northern Ireland and South Tyrol is not like South Ossetia. And uh, this is why the Kosovo case is treated also like successful self-determination uh, realized in unilateral way, not as a result of negotiations, reconciliations. One side decided to secede and okay, it uh, will be supported. And uh, the task for the parts of the conflict to find rather um, uh, forceful, rather uh, rich of resources, part which will uh, promote your self-determination. It's also part of the discussion. And uh, I understand uh, we have lack of the time. It's necessary to uh, maybe uh, leave opportunity to discuss more about uh, some phases. This is why uh, my presentation is not strictly logical. I try to raise some interesting questions. I suppose that um, no idea, no practices when one experience could be automatically uh, placed or put uh, on uh, the other place. Maybe Northern Irish experience is great. Yeah, we can say very successful. Mm, taking into the account a lot of problems existing even now, but um, I don't think that automatically uh, this experience should be uh, should be placed or should be moved from this part to uh, South Ossetia or to Abkhazia because a lot of different uh, issues uh, exist. Even a conflict in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, the two conflicts in one Georgian uh, context are very different in terms of strategic goals of the sides. Abkhazia tends to build the, its own state while South Ossetia dreams about unification with the brothers from North Ossetia and the Russian species. It's a redentist project, not a separatist one. And uh, I remember brilliantly as a part of those dis numerous discussions between Armenians and Azeris when uh, Armenian side said, okay, uh, we are analyzing the experience of Alant Island, uh, territory with a Swedish majority and the Finnish auspices. Okay, we are ready to be part of Finland, not Azerbaijan. And the Azerbaijani side reacted, okay, you are not Swedes, first of all, to criticize us, we are not uh, Finns. Uh, yes, of course, uh, the case of Karabakh is a problem between Azeris and Armenians. We can say they are not so good like Finns and Swedes, maybe. It's not politically correct, by the way. But uh, nevertheless, they have different sets of problems, different uh, intensity of conflicts, and so on, so on. Uh, and uh, one more point, last not the least. Speaking about um, uh, expert of ideas, we uh, will touch every time uh, with the uh, narrative of the Western powers, the role of civil society, or the role of uh, non-state actors, and so on. Frankly speaking, I'm uh, rather skeptical to uh, this experience also, because I know a lot of people from NGOs, from Armenia, Azerbaijan, Abkhazia, Georgia, now I am not uh, supporting of this status or that status. So uh, I, I can say that a lot of uh, conflicts have uh, deal with contested uh, territory and problem of identity. But we should take into the account some uh, important things. First of all, civil society every time is a part of society generally. This is why this part of the society shares a lot of stereotypes, fears, phobias, as well as society at all. And I know personally a lot of uh, people in Azerbaijan, as well as Armenia, who were suppressed by the government, who were uh, freedom fighters, who were uh, NGO activists uh, uh, and um, independent media activists, 
who are now uh, mobilized, were mobilized and mobilized themselves in favor of protection of the uh, territorial integrity or vice versa self-determination. Let's see on Rauf Mirkadira, well-known Azerbaijani journalist. Uh, what is the uh, topic of his uh, uh, reflection right now? The presence of Russian peacekeepers. Because he sees in this situation the penetration of foreign power in the Azerbaijani dynamics. And he estimates this problem as a main important challenge, not problem of, for example, uh, Armenian minority, which uh, should be part of uh, territorial integral Azerbaijan, of fate of monasteries and so on and so on. First of all, territorial integrity, or other case, um, Elgar Mamedov, good colleague and friend of mine who invited me sometimes in some events in Baku, but he was arrested some years ago and uh, a lot of uh, activists, even French president, claimed for his liberation, release. And after his release, he began criticizing French president for extremely pro-Armenian position. It's necessary to take into the account because sometimes civil society in many aspects is more radical than people who are in power, who have uh, responsibility and uh, some restrictions. Uh, dependence on Russia, dependence on the United States or some other powers, Turkey or so, 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 somebody else. This is why it's not so linear. It's necessary to understand that this engagement could be could be useful, of course, because it's uh, the alternative view. Uh, and uh, I am not sure that everybody think only about uh, final victory of its own side, of course. But a lot of phenomena uh, appeared as a result of the conflict in the um, uh, ranks of uh, civil society activists. Such phenomena as uh, ethnocentric uh, human rights activism, for example. When people realize a lot of program, but they say, okay, we are taking care about refugees because our government is not so effective. But it means on their own, our refugees, not refugees from uh, the other side. Yes, I know I know a good uh, NGO activist in Abkhazia who really protested, who really fought against corruption, against some negative trends inside this uh, republic. But at the same time, uh, it does not mean they are ready to recognize the problem of Georgian refugees or IDPs in this territory. And some other examples. Denise can uh, criticize me, we can partly agree or fully agree, who knows, about the uh, volunteer development in Ukraine. On the one side, yeah, it's great because uh, those people relied only on their aspirations, uh, not uh, dependent on the government and uh, making initiatives in their own ways. But those people also are responsible for the escalation of the conflict in Donbass because they address not for negotiations with people on the ground, but they get it, uh, money, collected money for weapons, for some foods, for uh, the uh, armed volunteers and regular troops to uh, contain Donbass and uh, blaming uh, the uh, opposite side as uh, uh, separatists or Vatniki or some other uh, specific terms not so politically correct, by the way. It's a problem. This is why, of course, recognizing the importance of the civil society and human initiatives and so on and so on. We also should pay attention to the problem of uh, uh, not so constructive role of NGO activists, civil society, media for hatred speeches, for uh, promotion of negative image of the other side, of the others. It, it's, it's a problem also. Uh, this is why this problem is so complex, I suppose. And uh, it's great that GCSP today uh, draws attention to this issue. Because usually uh, when we discuss the problems of um, uh, conflicts, we are focusing on geopolitics. The role of US, the role of Russia, great game, big game. When my uh, good friend recently said, the grand game of the small people. Okay, but the scale of the people is discussable. But nevertheless, great games, interest, rivalry, and so on. Uh, missing the problem of uh, people living on the ground, suffering every day from the uh, absence of positive dynamics. And it's it, it's a great, uh, you uh, uh, gave us advantage to discuss this issue, but we should not forget about 
some uh, problematic notes. Not saying uh, that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm finishing, Yulia, I, I understand now, I'm, I'm concluding. Not making like in the Soviet style era that, oh, the uh, civil society or NGO looks like Marx, Lenin, which are always right and uh, doing only positive things. It's necessary to have balance. Balance and analyzing uh, some uh, possible advantages and disadvantages. Thank you so much for uh, your uh, patience, ready to listen to my skepticism. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sergei. So uh, your uh, speech might, uh, might seem provocative uh, to someone, but that's why we usually invite Sergei to add uh, uh, some uh, controversial uh, uh, statements uh, for our discussions. Some spicy, yes, a bit. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, so, Sergei, basically... Uh, if we make conclusions uh, from your uh, speech, uh, you say that there could be positive uh, examples and cases and negative uh, examples. Uh, and uh, we should remember about that. And also to some, uh, a military operation could seem like a solution uh, to the problem. And um, your major point seems to be that actually every case is unique. Uh, so probably that can be explained by your historical background and education, while Denise and Julia have a background in social sciences, so I expect some more generalizations from our next two speakers, and probably they will tell us that we still <laughs> can suggest some practices uh, in mediation and dialogue which can be useful in different regions of the world. Uh, so let me uh, once again introduce uh, Denis Matviev, a trainer and practitioner dealing with mediation and dialogue practices. Denis, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Yulia and Alexandra. Um, great to have the invitation from the organizers uh, for this timely event. And as always, uh, interesting to listen to uh, Sergei. And uh, I think that uh, um, I hope that there will be some complementarity between uh, between Sergei's approach of uh, looking at, um, at different potential political examples um, and, uh, and my approach, where well, I'll take more of a thematic approach um, to looking at, uh, at uh, international experience. Um, and I, I'm not just going to talk about civil society, Sergei. Uh, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, look, let me, let me begin by um, explaining some of the um, some of the examples which I'll share with you and some of the approaches which I'll share with you and, and contextualizing why um, I think um, uh, why, why I'm, I'm I decided to go in a certain direction for our discussion today I mean we, we all know that conflicts in Eurasia span a, a broad range of, uh, of different kinds of conflicts some are frozen because there's a lack of a political solution which is acceptable to elites, um, and then others are rather hot, as we've seen in, in Nagorno-Karabakh more recently, with really a strong component of, of enmity between ethnic groups or, or, or groups with other identity-driven distinctions. So, so some conflicts are driven top-down, others do have a significant bottom-up component. Um, and I think it's very important to distinguish between, um, between those different drivers of conflicts, um, because if you have um, elite-driven conflicts and interest-based mediation, um, will probably provide you with the key. Whereas if you have conflicts which are rooted from the beginning um, in mistrust, in injustice, um, in trauma at the grassroots level, um, or maybe over time such feelings have, have built up, um, then you have to have um, uh, an approach uh, which is not only based on top-level interest-based mediation. Um, and I think it's not going to be a surprise to anybody if I say that in the post-Soviet tradition of peace mediation and engagement with armed conflicts, um, really does focus mainly on the instruments of official mediation and military peacekeeping. Um, now, I think that these tools do not always address the needs of the affected populations. Um, and indeed, um, they, they do not address the influence that these populations can have on the ability of elites to negotiate peace, right? This, this, this bottom-up uh, influence that, that um, is often there. Um, now, look, I, I think the existence of large sectors um, in a particular society which feel strongly affected by conflict can affect the prospects for sustainable conflict res resolution in several different ways. And I'm, I'm going to list four ways that I think are important for us to analyze before we get onto instruments and, and, and tools. 
Um, first of all, if you have heavily traumatized populations, um, it's very unlikely that they're going to support um, sensible strategies for conflict resolution. Um, they are likely to act uh, in a certain way in, in, in terms of their electoral preferences, in terms of their, their public behavior, um, which will reduce the political space for political elites and, as you say, Sergei, and for civic elites as well, to be able to propose solutions which are based, um, uh, which are rooted in, in unavoidable compromises. So a compromise will be difficult to negotiate if you have a heavily traumatized population. Um, this can also have the flow on effect um, of radicalizing the views and expectations of the political mainstream. Um, so for example, if you have um, several different approaches within a society, so if a conflict has a domestic component, um, that can lead to deep divisions within the political system. So that's, that's another impact. And if you have those deep divisions which are driven by radicalized views and expectations, then this can have a toxic flow and effect on the whole political process of the country in question and the whole political culture, um, really you know, hamstringing even beyond conflict issues, the ability to, to make progress. Um, the, third, the third impact is that I think feelings of injustice among the population can lead to politically unrealistic expectations on how justice should be served. Again, making prospects for reconciliation rather difficult uh, because reconciliation requires a step towards each other. It requires certain compromise. And, and finally, um, in, in my experience, in my observations, um, mistrust uh, towards the other, towards the enemy, tends to feed on itself and it deepens over time if it's left unaddressed. So, so time does not heal wounds in this particular case. Um, you know, what happens is that the wounds get deeper you get hate speech, as Sergei said, you get dehumanization, and ultimately you get a security-driven mentality in society, which then leads to a militarization of culture as well. Um, that can affect human capital, it can affect the development potential of whole society. So I think these, these um, um, kinds of impacts that, that move beyond elites and beyond interest-based negotiations really have to be considered. And, and I think the good news is that there are, there are tools and instruments out there which can address some of these factors and which, which haven't been used that much in, in post-Soviet contexts. Um, let me mention uh, a couple which may be useful, and I'm very happy to have a discussion afterwards uh, with everybody who's, who's present, and including our, including our esteemed uh, uh, audience. So one, uh, one uh, approach which I think is worth examining is that of national dialogues. Um, national dialogues can be helpful in ensuring more inclusion um, in ensuring a sense of participation and ultimately more support for a negotiated peace process. Um, they can help to bridge domestic political divides about how to proceed with a, with a peace process, um, building domestic political consensus and therefore a stronger mandate for negotiations. Um, they can also help to bridge divergent points of view if a conflict has a domestic, has, has an internal dimension. And we know that in these days, in this day and age, many conflicts have a hybrid nature, not only in the way that they're um, waged, but also in, in their roots and, and the reasons that exist for them, both domestic and international. And if you combine um, a national dialogue approach um, with a truth and reconciliation um, type of methodology, then that can help to deal with the collective trauma that's related to armed conflict. So you're not just talking about what to do, but you're also talking about the past and you're talking about how to deal with that past. Um, the, the, the trick with national dialogues, particularly compared to some, some attempts which have been branded as such in the post-Soviet space, the trick is to make sure that the participation of the population is real, um, that the process has public legitimacy. It's not just something which is, which is invented for, for the purposes of political instrumentalization, um, but also that the process isn't just a, a civil society driven bottom-up process, that it has political legitimacy and support as well. And of course, it has to be very professionally designed and run. It, it can't be a sort of, um, you know, spur of the moment effort with with some people who've uh, who've heard about it, uh, you know, uh, somewhere <laughs> somewhere on the news. So it has it has to be a very real and thought out process. Um, the second example I wanted to give of of a potentially useful tool, which really hasn't been used very much at all um, in the post-Soviet space, is um, instruments of transitional justice um, for the purposes of truth and reconciliation. Um, we, we know that armed conflict always entails a loss of life, um, and often it also entails crimes, um, including war crimes, um, and also it often includes difficult political decisions um, which are made and then are questioned later on as to whether they were the right ones and you know, should they have left to the, led to the kind of 
um, uh, consequences that, that they did. And then around those, around those tragedies and crimes and political decisions, um, narratives are created um, and take on a life of their own. And I think we, we don't need to search very far for examples of societies which, which have really sort of lived within their own encapsulated narratives for, for decades, if not in some cases, uh, you know, hundreds of years. And, and these narratives um, focus on the trauma of war, they focus on reasons for unresolved conflict, and they make it much more difficult to um, work on dialogue and mediation in the, in the present, and the longer this continues, the harder it is in the future. So, as I said earlier, it's important to prevent um, the deepening of unaddressed trauma and further po polarization after the violence is finished. Um, and and the, I think here, transitional justice gives us um, some very good insights. The, the four pillars, for example, um, around which transitional justice processes are built, I'm just going to mention quickly for us to reflect on. Um, one being a focus on the truth about what happened during periods of violence. The second pillar being about making sure there is justice and accountability for the greatest violations, for the gravest violations. Um, the third one being about making sure that victims um, get reparations, that they get a sense of, um, of being recognized and uh, a sense of that they can move forward and develop um, beyond the trauma that they've experienced. Um, and finally, a guarantee of non-recurrence of violence and of human rights violations. So how do we make sure it's not just a talking shop, but it's also um, that instruments or that, that um, arrangements are put into place, which will make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah. So if we think about these four pillars, I think that gives us a, uh, an idea as to how um, processes can be designed, which not only address some of these legal and political aspects, but also create the emotional and the political space to begin reconciliation between the warring sides. If we think about truth, if we think about justice, if we think about um, uh, uh, dealing with victims on all the sides, that can open up space um, for discussions on how to, how to build a new future together, even after the deepest, the deepest of, of, of trauma to each other. Um, two more, if I have the time, uh, Julia. Um, one, uh, one I'm sure will bring a smile to Sergei's face because it is about civil society dialogues. Um, but I, I, wanna, I wanna be very clear here. Um, it's important, first of all, that any sort of civil society dialogues uh, or, or grassroots level dialogues, the population level dialogues are done in complement um, with official negotiations or to support the progress in official negotiations. Um, and also that they address people's real needs. Um, for example, searching for missing persons um, on both sides of a conflict divide or addressing local development needs um, rooted in the need to reconstruct economies and livelihoods after armed conflict. Um, or you know, reuniting separated families and friends, things that make sense to, to real people and not just to academics or, or professional uh, uh, you know, NGO specialists. Um, and I think that the reason that, that this civic level engagement is important is because on the one hand, it prepares people um, for um, living in peace in the future. And these participatory methods we know very well are more uh, effective than, than top-down propaganda. Um, and secondly, because people who have personal experience engaging in dialogue with their opposite side, with their um, enemies or with those who have caused them trauma, once they have gone through that process, they can act as examples with personal experience for the broader societies that coexistence and cooperation is possible beyond um, the armed conflict. Um, but I, again, I want to I caveat this um, with saying that dialogues have to be run in a transformative way. They can't be um, ex you know, replications of political TV talk shows or official negotiations without a mandate. They need to affect the way people um, relate to each other, their relationships, they need to affect people's attitudes, they need to change people's behaviors. And so it needs to be, ser they need to be serious processes with serious results. And finally, the fourth one that I want to mention um, is, is to do with security arrangements and ceasefires. Um, we, we know from other parts of the world, and again, this is not something which, is, which has been done, I think, in post-Soviet countries um, at all, uh, but we know from other parts of the world that um, that uh, ceasefire implementation, including monitoring and verification, can't be limited to military aspects. If you 
if, if it is to be effective and sustainable. Civilian populations need to understand what the ceasefire is about. They need to support it. Um, they need to make sure that uh, whatever uh, problems it might cause for them, such as operation of checkpoints or, or movement of, uh, of military equipment and personnel or taking over of buildings and land, you know, any sort of impact that, that ceasefire and security arrangements have on, on the common person need to be very clear and very well understood and supported. Otherwise, civilian populations can create um, risks for ceasefire implementation and can create resistance and, and sometimes strong resistance. So human rights and human security have to be among the objectives of ceasefire um, arrangements. And the best way to make sure that, that those objectives are addressed um, is to involve civilians in the ceasefire implementation, uh, because the civilians have better access to other civilians, they have better understanding of, of, of their needs usually. Um, and such components can be written into ceasefire agreements. So um, components of civilian monitoring and verification and civilian um, needs assessments and, and so on. They can be made part of official ceasefire mechanisms. So there can be a military component and a civilian component in the, in the ceasefire mechanism. And they can be added also later on um, after the official agreements are initially made through focused arrangements, focusing on the civilian component. So I think that's something, that's something that might be worth exploring as well. Um, now, if I have another two minutes, um, uh, Yulia, let, let me just make a quick comment on, on track one mediation efforts in the post-Soviet space. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't resist, I'm afraid. Um, look, we, I think we all know that the way that mediation processes, official mediation processes are run um, in, uh, in Eastern Europe um, is that uh, they're, they're designed and driven mainly by uh, political considerations between the designers. So if we look at the OAC Permanent Council, the kind of mandates that it's able to generate are very much the result of political bargaining. Uh, so all conflicts in, in this region have a geopolitical imprint, what I call a geopolitical imprint, on the way that they are, that they are negotiated. And that leads to there being little trust um, towards technical expertise um, and external advice is often seen as part, as part of that zero sum game. Um, and, I, and I think that that's something that, that um, should change over time. Um, I think more investment in space um, for professional process design would really help. Um, and I think that uh, we need to be clear that, that um, the best diplomats and the best politicians are not necessarily gonna be prepared for conflict resolution and even conflict management type of exercises. It's, it's a special skill set. Um, communications with political constituencies are something that really suffers, I think, in, in, in the region that we're talking about. They're often opaque um, and, and then they're often very unstrategic. So to expect public support for a peace process, for a negotiation process at the top level, you need to be able to communicate what you're doing very well um, to your constituencies. And that needs to work not only top down, but also bottom up as well. So real inclusion of the voices of those who are affected by conflict um, is something that we need to keep thinking about and keep keep working out how to how to make it happen um, in, a, in a sensible and realistic way. So look, um, I, I think I think that's part of the reason why uh, things work the way they do is because there's a, a desire to control um, track one processes because there's often a lack of political will. Um, to move forward substantively. So there's a great desire to control what happens at the top um, if you don't want it to move forward. Um, but even if, um, even if it is a conflict is frozen, even if there's not an expectation of, of political dynamism, I think it's important to prepare for the time when, when the political dynamism will return. Because if, if the preparation is not done of the kind that I've been describing until now, then even when the political will comes, any process can run into difficulties if it doesn't have public support um, or if it generates public protest um, against the solution which is being negotiated. And we know that many processes have stalled and failed in this way. And I think it's our responsibility to do what we can to make sure that doesn't happen um, in the region that we're talking about. I'll stop there. Thanks for listening and happy to engage in the discussion. Thank you very much, Denise. Uh, so Denise uh, mentioned two major approaches that uh, we can explore for possible use in Eurasian national dialogue and uh, instruments of transitional justice. Uh, also, he mentioned civil society dialogue and some limitations of uh, track one official um, cooperation and um, negotiations uh, and uh, generally uh, Denise um, called us to be very uh, cautious, uh, cautious when we uh, 
use uh, such approaches uh, because the dialogues need to be transformative. And here we can probably draw a parallel with a person who would visit a psychologist. And if that's, a, a, well, in Eurasia, that's something new and something that people are still ashamed of uh, going to psychologists, uh, consulting them. And psychologists uh, may not be very professional and people can get re-traumatized. So the same can happen to societies. Uh, and of course, it takes a lot of time. So transformation is really important and we also have to understand Understand that it takes a lot of time, so this stress this aspect as well. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and now um, I give the floor to Dr. Julia Palmiano Federer. Uh, she will share her uh, experience uh, with the Myanmar peace processes because she participated uh, in the mediation. Uh, different mediation processes provided support of civil society actors and the negotiation teams. So the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And I've provided also um, a PowerPoint um, as well, uh, just so for all you visual learners out there. And I think if we take a deep dive into this context, it'll help to know a little bit about the, the country context itself. Uh, so thanks for having me uh, to here to share about Myanmar's peace processes. and. I think it's interesting. Uh, it's defied traditional diplomacy and, and, and mediation in so many ways. So I hope that you can find it useful when thinking about the own context that you're working on. Uh, a bit more about my experience uh, in Myanmar. So I, I work with Swiss Peace. I was a program officer from 2013 um, until this year, primarily supporting um, Myanmar peace process actors, civil society, women, um, women leaders in Myanmar in the nationwide ceasefire agreement phase of the process, which was about 2013 to 2017. Um, I also conducted my doctoral research on Myanmar, so living there for a year and a half doing field research, uh, looking at the role of how informal and unofficial dialogue processes uh, uh, played uh, a role in the peace process and what impact it had. Um, I will be incoming uh, head of research at the Ottawa Dialogue come January, which is a university-based organization which actually runs Track 2 and Track 1.5 dialogues around the world, doing research and training. Um, but these views here are, are my own. If you are to remember one thing from this presentation, uh, it's, it's really going to focus on this. In my experience in Myanmar, the best practices and kind of effectiveness largely boil down to trust. And I know that sounds very basic, um, especially in this field, but in the Myanmar process, it was very slowly built uh, since 2011. And in my view, slowly being eroded and the stakes are too high for that right now. And so what I wanna show you through specific examples is that you can have a beautifully well-designed process, um, but if there's no trust in that process, it's gonna have a hard time moving forward. So my insights are centered around what that actually means how trust was practically built and, and what urgently needs to happen to keep trust from disappearing from the process altogether. So a brief overview, uh, if I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Myanmar is a country strategically located in Southeast Asia, bordering Bangladesh, the two giants of India and China in the region, Thailand and Laos. Um, it's home to just over 50 million people and, and the number itself is, is contested due to um, what I will speak to, to you about uh, shortly. It's extremely ethnically and linguistically diverse. And what I wanted to dr drive home was the point that ethnicity and religion are, are really important identity markers in Myanmar. And it, they really underlie most aspects of social and political life. Uh, and this played a, a massive role in the, in the conflict until today. The country is divided into states and regional divisions. And if you can see around the border areas, uh, that's where most of the ethnic nationalities um, are, are situated, many of whom have taken up an armed resistance struggle against the, cent the central government and the Tamada, which is the, the Myanmar army, since after gaining independence from the British in 1948. So over 70 years of armed conflict to this point. Um, so these armed ethnic organizations or, or EAOs have ranged all the way up to 40 EAOs operating in the country at one point. The struggle is basically for this idea of a federal union and self-determination, this, this kind of innate drive to speak their own language, practice their own religion, 
and essentially resisting the dominance of what they feel is this Burman Bamar, which is the dominant ethnicity, about 70% of the country, um, and the Buddhist religion. Uh, so you have, after 70 years of conflict, complex, I'm not going to go into it in 10 minutes, uh, complex dynamics of center, periphery, politics. You have a state that's in the middle of a, a massive political transition from a militarized and authoritarian state to a democracy. Uh, you have the weight of big neighbors such as India and China, and you have uh, this resistance to, to international intervention and let's say orthodox forms of, of mediation diplomacy. Okay, so if I could go to the next slide. Uh, so just the state of the art of, of the peace process, if I could introduce it to you. Um, so in the form of, it's very long. So if I just could funnel it down into three flashpoints in 2011, 2015 and 2020. So this man uh, is Utain Sain. He led a quasi civilian government um, that basically had tried to reignite the peace process in 2011 signing different bilateral ceasefires with different armed groups. You fast forward four years later of negotiations and you had what was called the nationwide ceasefire agreement in which uh, eight out of a 16 member block of ethnic armed organizations basically signed uh, a ceasefire agreement that was supposed to be nationwide. Uh, this happened just before a historic and landslide election. Many of you are very familiar probably um, next uh, a picture, please, of, of this woman, Da Aung San Suu Kyi, who was a Demo uh, democracy opposition leader um, at, the, at the time. So she had um, inherited in 2015, basically, a peace process that had just been signed after years of negotiations, uh, a ceasefire a, a mechanism of the joint monitoring mechanisms, and basically the start of an implementation process that was supposed to go towards a larger national and political dialogue as uh, Denise was just speaking about. Um, if you fast forward to 2020, um, the peace process is stalled and fraught. And while under her government, you had a, um, several instances of a union peace conference, which was a large scale national dialogue, which had everyone essentially. You had um, the armed organizations, uh, the, the Tamara present, you had political parties, you had civil society organizations, the first of its kind unprecedented in the country. But at the same time, you have very difficult dynamics of um, groups that, armed groups that have signed, armed groups that haven't signed. You had complex arrangements of, of splinter groups, um, new alliances operating along the Chinese border. You had in inter-ethnic armed group politics, um, and you had the, uh, the emergence of a powerful new armed group called the Arakan Army. And then 2020, you know, you were also seeing um, uh, a new national election where the NLD, her party won again, um, but very, very much less popular in ethnic nationality areas, which I'll explain. You have the aftermath of the mass exodus of the Rohingya humanitarian crisis. And of course you have the outbreak of COVID on a global level. So if you go forward to the next two sort of photos. So this photo is basically was the government um, peace architecture that they had put forward. I'm not gonna try to explain. These are kind of all the, the actors. Um, and you can find this on the Myanmar Peace Monitor. Uh, and then if you go forward to the next photo, thank you. That shows it's another iteration of the Myanmar's peace architecture. So all of these different instruments, these practices, these armed groups, um, and it just goes to show how complex the, the architecture of Myanmar's peace process actually got over the years. Um, and I'll make a comment on that after. So where are we? And the last um, kind of half is kind of three insights and three lessons learned that I want to bring to you to discuss later um, in Myanmar. So next slide, please. Right, so for me, uh, what the most important things I thought were noteworthy about Myanmar's process that facilitated trust uh, were these early movers. So facilitating trust among the parties. You had very intense and extremely low climate of trust in 2011. Um, you had government negotiators actually going into EAO controlled territory or across the border into Thailand, meeting in very informal um, and unofficial avenues for, for dialogue. Um, then you also had, and, and this was really, really important. Um, yeah, tr facilitating trust and buy-in of the process. I mean, Dennis was, was, was talking about this and this was really, really, um, really 
important in the Myanmar process because it never had happened um, because it was under an authoritarian military government for so many years in which media oppression, um, the inability of, of civil society groups to meet, um, it was unprecedented in many, many ways. So in a sense, you had the peace process um, actors actually actively consulting with civil society organizations, women's organizations, and the media, who for the first time were actually able to freely publish analysis and discourse after so many decades of an intense media um, suppression. But even though this is very you know, critiqued, um, formal negotiations were still mostly limited to track one official actors. It was a massive departure from the past. So this facilitated public buy-in of the process. And then last, uh, next point, uh, you have trust in the vision. Okay, so these are kind of NCA and Panglong 21 are, are names for, for process design structures that have really deep symbolic meaning in the Myanmar process. Peng Long um, was, the, what was, was the name of the national dialogue that took place um, in three iterations thus far. And Peng Long uh, speaks to an agreement that was signed in 1947 among ethnic nationalities and the central, the kind of new nascent central government of the time. And it speaks to this really important and deeply held promise of self-determination and equal status of ethnic nationalities in Myanmar. So actually naming that national dialogue, Pang Long, um, was a massive kind of symbol of, of, of trust and kind of the vision that was holding the whole peace process together. So I'm gonna end with uh, you know, a couple points about where I feel that this trust is being eroded and what urgently is needed to keep this trust alive in the process. So if you go to the next slide, you have, um, um, Okay, so if you go to the next point, yeah. You have what happened in 20, 2015 to 2010, you basically a change in government, right? And then you have the, the particular personality and leadership style of Da Aung San Suu Kyi, um, which you know, many analysts and, and people that, that have been critical of, of the momentum of the process will say that it has contributed to a lot of this, um, the, the movement thus far. Uh, so what this means in particular, and what I hope you can bring to your own context and, and the regions that you're working on, is process design decisions can both build or erode trust. And what does that actually mean? So in the Myanmar context, um, you know, something as kind of process designy as picking your negotiation team, essentially the negotiation team that was that was built and um, from 2011 to 2015 was all, were all swapped out. Um, and that had, you know, basically wiped out years and years of informal trust building between the two negotiators. The new negotiators were, were very limited in capacity and knowledge of, of these specific skills of negotiation and mediation. Um, and they were trusted advisors to Aung San Suu Kyi, but not necessarily to the parties. Then another process design aspect was that it was highly centralized and bureaucratic. So so basically everything had to go through the central government um, in ways that it hadn't needed to before. Um, so there was a lot of critique at that point about how things like informal dialogues that were so necessary in building that early trust uh, were essentially not happening anymore. And this was a, a really important um, aspect of the negotiations that, that um, a lot of analysts now say are, are really missing and are some of the most um, urgent things to, to bring back in some capacity. Um, um, yeah, and because this had no genuine informal dialogue to rebuild trust among the parties, it had become too formal, too architecturalized, um, some critics would say. And so these moments to build genuine trust and dialogue were getting lost in the bureaucracy and architecture, essentially. Uh, the second point is that, yeah, so the second point is there. The process should be contextualized more in national and regional politics. There's many transitions going on in Myanmar. Alongside the peace process is a, a massive process of political reform to reform the constitution. So thinking about where does the peace process, you have, let's say, a, a beautiful peace agreement and political accord at the end, um, wherever, when you, wherever you get there, what happens after? Does it get integrated into the constitution and how? So these are the questions that Myanmar um, peace practitioners are grappling with and have no answer to. And, and not having answers to questions like these are, are further eroding <laughs> trust in, in the process as well. 
Um, you know, and what is the role of the Myanmar military plays in the negotiations now? So uh, what the role of China is in negotiations has is, is been a massive topic in the last few years. Um, so really being able to, 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 um, to have answers to those questions. And that's, that's more easily said than done, obviously. And then I want to end on, on a, a final point. Um, so exactly, vision. Um, most importantly, and I think most dangerously, I would argue that the vision is, is lacking in the Myanmar peace process going forward of what the goal of the peace process should be um, and the strong leadership required to support this vision. I think that in the end, the, the key questions are, are how to understand and come to terms with what national identity in Myanmar actually means. What does it mean to be a Myanmar citizen, a citizen of this country, and how to decouple, um, I've heard from um, some analysts, and I think this is an important point, to decouple um, you know, identity markers such as ethnicity and religion from national identity and what that means um, um, for your peace process design going forward. And yeah, I won't go more into it here. I'm happy to answer more questions around that because it's a little bit of a sensitive topic, um, especially in the Myanmar context. But I think for any peace process design in any region without that kind of you know, large scale visioning, the peace process design can get lost uh, very easily. And I think I will, if you go to the next slide, I will leave it there. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, so uh, you highlighted that actually uh, design of the peace process is very important. And indeed, uh, in Eurasia, it, it seems to me that policymakers tend to forget about that uh, because they're usually happy about concluding an elite level deal, uh, track one diplomacy and uh, well, what goes next? Um, well, we can discuss it uh, in our Q&A uh, session. Uh, so basically the conclusion is that we really need uh, some professionals who would uh, uh, design uh, those peace processes, who would be very cautious in implementing all those uh, practices of mediation and national dialogue, because uh, all those processes are related to ethnicity, identity, and very sensitive topics. <laughs>